rights and actually ask a question <laughs> in a room filled with people. So we will wait patiently uh, as we look. Uh, I think we see our first question. Uh, or no, she's just getting up to excuse herself. So. Um, <laughs> I was asking a question, hello. Um, my name is Bailey Walker, can you hear me? Yep, yes. Okay, um, my name is Bailey Walker and I have a rather large overarching question for everyone. Um, when considering and when navigating this, this fake news landscape, what is gonna be the solution? Is it gonna be policy like Warner and McCain just introduced? Is it gonna be you know, getting out of our gerrymandered news bubbles? Is it, is it going to be teaching media literacy in schools? Is it going to be a combination of these things? I'm just, especially yeah. as a young person, I'm trying to navigate this in a way that, that uh, you know, we don't fall for fake news stories. Um, so, Bailey, just to make sure we understand, you've actually asked Washington insiders for a solution? Is yeah. That <laughs> Never hurts to try. <laughs> Thank you, Bailey. It's a great question. I'll take a, yeah, I'll take, a, I'll take a shot, Bailey. I think it's, I think it's all the above. Okay. Just, just what you said. I think it's all the above. On the policy front, I think, um, you know, if you're all familiar with Winston Churchill's quote about um, democracy is the worst form of government until you consider the alternative, to paraphrase that, you know, our form of media right now um, it's probably better than some of the alternatives, meaning countries where you have absolute and total censorship and the government decides exactly what you are going to see. And in that respect, you can argue that that is, that is fake news. It is manipulated purposefully. So I'll take the messiness. I think what's going to be interesting, though, is in the middle, maybe Europe, because Jack, to your point, I think uh, contemplating that the U.S. Congress is going to move is... It's hard to see how that comes together, but I think Europe um, feels no such constraint, and, right. and Germany has already introduced um, legislation. I believe France has as well. France just came out of an election. Germany just came out of an election. I actually think they'll move, as they have moved much more aggressively on trying to protect consumer privacy. So we may, within a few years, begin to see emerging policies that we haven't yet adopted, but Western democracies, who for the most part believe on some level in, um, in a free, robust media, um, certainly you know, more so than, um, than, than countries um, for which there, there is no press freedom, we may begin to see some models that, that we may want to replicate in, in small little parts. You know, I think to say if you're going to regulate um, Silicon Valley sounds so dramatic, you know, like it's, it's everything or it's nothing. I think there's any number of policies, which I know your boss is, is looking at, which is, you know, can, does sunshine help? If you have transparency and you know the mm -hmm. source of the media information, does that then help, to your point, make informed decisions about do I trust this influencer, do I trust this publication or this website based on, on transparency? So I, I do think it's going to be all of the above. And then I think the responsibility is going to fall on, on individuals, as people have pointed out, to make some determinations. To, does this feel right to me? Kevin, do you want to add anything to that? Um, you know, it's been it's been interesting to watch um, the the growing recognition of Silicon Valley that they uh, they've grown so big and the data they hold and use is so vast that it's hard harder for them to contend that they are neutral platforms. The, 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 the algorithmic way in which selected information is sliced and diced and presented to you, the ability to take fake news and put it atop your news feed without any labeling that it's paid content or of a political nature um, doesn't, doesn't confuse a discerning or educated or savvy social media consumer, but I would argue is unnecessarily confusing and manipulative for folks that perhaps aren't as, as fully comfortable or educated with the way the technology can be misused. So I, I think that's where the conversation is now. I think there's a, it's now a negotiation about um, um, 
what it's going to look like. And, and to your point, um, to show the, the pivot that Facebook made after last November, um, after the election, when it was suggested that the Russians may have used Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg was widely quoted saying that was crazy, that they had any impact whatsoever on the election results. So, Bailey, if I may, yours is such a great question we could spend the entire morning on. And if we do run out of questions uh, before our time is up, we'll get back to it. But if I, if I may, I'm going to move over here to this gentleman. Yes, hello. So, uh, trust in mass media has dropped to about 32 percent amongst the American populace. That's the lowest it's been in over 20 years. So, I was wondering what can be done to repair that, that trust? Jack, do you want to uh, take um, that first? Sure, I'll take a shot at that. Uh, yeah, the media is about probably as popular as lawyers, maybe a little more, not much. Um, hey, Congress is at 11 And Congress, too, that's right. So we're all kind of in the same, same boat there. I think what can, be, what can help restore that trust, and I don't know that in this social-mediated world that we'll ever be back to where we were because we were the only game in town. And now we're not, and there are plenty of people that say that the media has agendas. There are plenty of people that say the media is not transparent enough, and perhaps we could be more transparent in some of the things we do. But I think ultimately what restores trust in media is good reporting, uh, extensive work like the New York Times has been doing with the Las Vegas shooting case that really very few other people have been doing, maybe some stuff online, but not the way the New York Times can do it. Um, not necessarily the way that we can do it at NPR, some of the things we cover and that we spend a lot of time covering that other people don't necessarily cover. I, I, but I understand why there's this feeling that, oh, you know, the traditional quote unquote media uh, has an agenda. I, I totally get that. What I, what I think is important to realize though is that Clearly, many people who are online also have agenda. Um, so I, I think, you know, what we can do for our part is to continue to do solid, good work and not kind of go down a road that maybe we shouldn't go down. And I don't know that answers your question, but I'm not sure beyond the fact that we are working in a, in a vast universe of facts and sources and fake news versus real news. And, and I think that's what we can do. Will we ever be back to the position we held before the advent of the internet and widespread dissemination of information? Probably not. And there's a lot of agendas going on right now, frankly, and people trust the agendas they want to trust. And I think that's a dangerous thing when people look in the mirror and say, well, I like this media channel because it reflects my views. I don't think that that's necessarily healthy for a democracy, but that's where we are. Roy, I know you've been very reluctant to state your views today, but um, <laughs> could, could you, uh, do you see Is some paths for regaining trust that you might recommend? It's still working. Is it still working? Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that, by the way, thank you for quoting Gallup data. That makes me feel good. Uh, so that gap, that 20% gap, and, and I think it dropped into th about 20 years ago, keep going down. Uh, to me, that, that's an alert for anyone who's in the media industry to kind of think of what's going on and, and keep their eyes open in terms of like what I'm talking about. This transition of audiences, they're moving to different places to consume their media because they're not trusting it. So that alone gives you room, future journalists, to basically be in that space where there's more trust and there's more credibility and there's more, uh, you know, closer, uh, less filters that they've built throughout, throughout the whole process of editorial process. Uh, and it's your room to basically create that ground and rebuild that trust because we're, I mean, we're consuming content online whether we like it or not. So it's up to you to kind of figure out how to tell that story and rebuild that trust through the channels that you're going to create yourself and be the, be the person who's trusted for that content that you're going to put out. Over, thank you, Roy. Over to the left, do you have a question? Hi, my name is Sydney Small and I'm from Lake Braddock Secondary School. And my question is, how can you be sure that social media is currently delivering the truth to the people without editing? You, you can't. <laughs> it's, up to, it's up to you to make that decision. And, and pretty much they're telling you their own version of the story. Again, and it's up to you. The beauty of social media, it, the, the ease to get other type of content from another person, it takes you three seconds to swipe right. You know, less than three seconds. And that, that's the beauty of digital where you can pretty much 
get different type of feeds from different type of people to make your own decision on the story? Yeah, one thing I would say is um, I have a um, I have a 19 year old and a 22 year old both in college, so 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 you're set. When they went off to college, I gave them each um, a gift, and the gift was an online subscription to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. I heavily encourage you to just put that in the mix. It's not a matter of one or the other. Uh, it's not a matter of denigrating one or, or suggesting that one is, is superior. Put it into the mix, though. Make sure that um, it will help you make more informed judgments about the influencers you follow. Uh, because there is just such an extraordinary level of review that if you're looking for the truth, I, I will go out on a limb and say that you're going to get closer to at least a group of people who are striving for the truth as their, as their ground game, in a sense. So um, I encourage you to do that. I, I want to thank Peter for offering to buy online subscriptions to the New York Times and Wall Street Journal for everyone. <laughs> Very the nice. support of Northrop mm. Grumman will make it happen. Right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was, Can I get one too? That was not planned. <laughs> to the right here. Uh, hello, the panelists. My name is Hung Gao. I am a public relations student at George Mason University. And um, my question is, um, you mentioned the impact of fake news on the media industry. But as a student, I'm very curious about how it affects, how specifically it affects your day-to-day -day work. So as professional um, communicator, how, you do, how do you convince reporters that you, that you are delivering truthful information to them? Or how you handle the conversation with your colleagues about fake news, how do you tell them that, okay, uh, the person who you're working with, that you're wrong? Uh, how, how do you tell your boss that you're using the wrong sources? How do you handle those conversation happening in the workplace? So, thank you. Uh, th thank you uh, very much for that question. So, Peter, maybe we I start... I felt the gaze. Yeah. <laughs> coming, right to, coming right to me. You, you, you owed me. I'll take, <laughs> I'll take a shot at that. Uh, you know, we have a, we have a structure um, within, within agency, and, and we're not unique. I'm, I'm quite sure Richard does the same thing, and if you want to talk to, to someone after the fact who can, who can talk more about it in practice, talk to Joseph Campbell, who, who I work with, who um, is at uh, Booz Allen. The, the, the standard that we, we seek to, to put in place is if we're going to craft messages, if we're going to say, this is who you are about company A, um, we are very thorough in making sure we have proof points to defend the messages that we're going to put out there. So I think in terms of the counsel that we provide, if we can't put the proof points, and I, and I know this is the same way when you know, your boss perhaps wants to say something, you sort of say, boss, we've got to put the proof points behind it. Otherwise, it's just going to fall, up, fall apart and reporters are going to say, I don't buy it. Show me the evidence. Um, show me the proof. And you do have to be rigorous in that process. And if you're not, then I think you're not being good stewards of the truth. So I do think that there's a, you know, frankly, just a methodology to that um, that makes sense. The, you know, the passion that comes with, a, you know, with, with people going onto social media and posting their own opinions or point of views, that's fine, but they, they, may, not, they may be guided by passion as opposed to a process of really asking themselves and questioning whether this is, this is as close to the truth as they can get. So, Jack, you're on the other side of that call. Well, let me bring up a real-world example. Does anybody, did anybody hear the term Pizzagate? Do you remember that story? All right. So this is like Hillary Clinton and I forget who else. Was it Podesta? Somebody. John Podesta. John Podesta are running a child sex ring out of a pizza parlor, Comet Ping Pong Pizza, on Wisconsin Avenue or Connecticut Avenue, wherever it was. I think it's Wisconsin. Um, Connecticut. Connecticut? Thanks. So it generates into this full-blown internet sensation. It's all over the place. There's a whole bunch of people that believe it. And then some guy drives up from, I forget, North Carolina to save the children and opens fire inside the pizza restaurant with a gun, okay? I'm just saying, every story out there is not true. And that's a really good example of one that isn't true, and it gained traction because there are a lot of people, for whatever reason, who decided they wanted to believe that Hillary Clinton and John Podesta were running a child sex ring out of a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C. So on that note, 
Um, why don't we ta uh, take, a qu <laughs> <laughs> take a question, please? Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, I am Tony. Um, I just wanted to say um, I think a lot of this has to do with the, um, the way we choose to interpret media these days. So, you know, I'm a student here, like a lot of you guys, and um, as a student, I had to read textbooks, and I loathe it. I hate textbooks. I just want the knowledge. I don't want to read the text. So, that being said, if you equate, yeah, right, if you equate traditional media to a textbook and social media to just an individual excerpt of that media, I think that is an accurate analogy, and I'll be the first to tell you that I would not be here today if I did not open up a textbook. Having the full excerpts and the context and the entire story behind what I'm supposed to be learning is extremely important, despite that many of my papers have been formed just from individual statements that I've picked up online. So do you think that is an accurate analogy, <coughs> excuse me, an accurate analogy to compare traditional media to a textbook and social media to just an excerpt? So here, here's how I think about it. So the reason you go to school to pretty much compensate for the lack of experience you have. So once you go to the workforce, you pretty much know that, you, you know, they think that you know what you're talking about, right? But what's going on is school, when, when school was constructed as a whole concept, is pretty much to get you ready for that world. But you're coming up to, you're, you're coming up to a world where the rules have changed already by the time you graduated. So it's up to you to kind of combine what I call, I mean, as Gary Vee talk about it a lot, is this whole thing of art and science meeting in the same time. So the book is the old traditional way, but the new way of doing things is more video, is more interactive, is more kind of consumption, like way, the way to keep your attention uh, hooked from three seconds, from the first three seconds, the next three seconds, the next three seconds, the next three seconds. So it's up to the educators, it's up to those who are constructing that learning experience for you to figure out that your learning style is more on the interactive side, is more on the hands-on side, is more on the practical side. So by the time you come out of here, you're already kind of like have learned in different mediums. The textbook is a great way, I, I call it, to have a structured learn learning, but it's up to you to engage deeper and create your learning experience throughout your school process. And I mean, think about it, you're, you have like a huge audience here, you have a network you can build on, the school has a, a media library you can build on, mul multiple interactive things, you can create your own stories. It's up to you to figure out how to start using and leveraging that those resources with the structural learning that's offering you to be ready for the world that you're going to be walking into once you graduate. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. They went off on a different tangent. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, anyone else want to help Tony? Defend? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think that that experience and uh, participatory learning. You know, I, I do some graduate teaching at Johns Hopkins, and we've been told, you know, we don't need you to be the sage on the stage. We need you to tell the students how we're going to do this exercise. And we do communications exercises, we do presentations, we do a lot of real world yeah. kind of things that they're gonna have to be able to do. And we use different social media tools, including um, you know, online and Facebook and Snapchat, and we video the presentations, and we do a lot of those kind of things. So yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, you know, Tony, if I may, I would just say one thing. I think that we all learn in different ways. Uh, and that the failure of textbooks often to be unable to cover certain subjects very well, the Vietnam War was reduced to a paragraph, should not in any way reduce us from reading and the desire to read and learn so much from so many different sources. Again, like going on, it's like there's learning and there's knowledge, you know. You can acquire knowledge from anywhere, but the way you think about it, learning can happen on your own and in school. And there's one thing also, by the way, I went to Hopkins. So uh, when I- when I think I, you're in my class. It's so good to see the relationship growing. <laughs> <laughs> but when I, when I, I also teach part-time at VIU, Virginia mm -hmm. International University, and the way I structure my class is once I walk in, it's a marketing class, I tell them, okay, tell me a dream you have. Tell me a vision you wanna build. Tell me a company you wanna start. And that's your class project, pretty much. And instead of talking about turning the whole, you know, talk about branding, what it's like to do branding or do another class project or an exercise from the textbook, I actually make you go out and do your own branding for your own company. Write that copy, create those, that logo, create that, you know, call to action. Think, you know, pick up the phone and call five people who already have that kind of business and go out and talk to them and learn from them. So this way, when you're 
This way you know more about it, and this way by the time you, want, you graduate, you get out of the world, you have that little case study, that little project you worked on, which is very hands-on experience, and it kind of combines the textbook and combines the learning. So pick up a project and actually go out and help someone execute it. Does that make sense? The way I think about it, I'm more a practitioner, so I, the, the reason you get hired because you bring in value to someone, you save them time. So figure out what value you want to bring into someone and how you're going to save them time doing it. I mean, that's what the whole you know, key thing about Uber, save you time, all this kind of stuff, save you time. So think where do you fit in their life story and what you're learning here, what value you can bring to someone's life to get their life better and make them do something different. Tony, thanks for the great question. Really appreciate it. And over here to the right, please. Hello, my name is Sylvia Pupe, and I'm a graduate student here um, in the communications department. And I guess, I'd, first of all, I want to thank both perspectives that have been shared on traditional media and new age media, because as we have discussed before, you know, in a millennial-based generation, we did grow up with a lot of digital media. And I think a lot of large mass companies such as CNN is realizing this and altering some of the things they're doing to appeal to that target audience. Because ideally, the main goal of media is so that everyone is knowledgeable and receives the story, receives information on every spectrum, political, entertainment, um, medical, whatever spectrum it is. So I guess my overall question is, and our new age of media and the usage of multiple media platforms, where does this leave millennials in terms of getting their foot in the door to become a journalist or to become a broadcaster or to work within news and media? Jack, you wanna take the first shot? Uh, sure, I think Chris spoke to that a little bit. Um, he said basically you need to be at the table. And you can get to the table different ways. You can do your own blogging. You can do your own online uh, sort of reporting. You can use Twitter. You can use uh, other social media platforms to get your view out and help build your brand. But I think if you want to actually be part of a traditional media organization, you need to go out and do traditional media. And that might mean that, you know, yes, we've hired some online, you know, internet stars, I suppose, over the years. But most of the people who come up through traditional media are there, right? He said, you, you need to be in the room. You need to be there when the conversation's being had. You need to have worked for several years at a different media outlet and kind of work your way up. Now, I do tell my students that you're not going to do it the same way I did it. You're not going to go from you know, uh, this little market to this market to Cleveland, Ohio, to Washington, D.C., to Washington Local, to Network. It's probably not going to work that way for you. But you have a big advantage that I didn't have, which is the Internet. So I tell all the students that I have to basically work to get their online journalism skills down as much as they can. You know, work with video, work with audio online, work with blogging, work with writing, do all those things together so that you're more than just one threat. You're like a triple threat or whatever you, however you want to put it. So try to get as much experience as you can online, working with the tools that are out there, learning how to use them, learning how to report, learning how to do the work that you will have to do once you get into a traditional media outlet, if that's what you want to do. And you may disagree. You may say traditional media outlets are nowhere and you shouldn't be wasting your time. I don't know. But I mean, I think if that's what you want to do, I think that's how you do it. Here's what I, my advice to you is pick what you're good at and become great at it. And if you're good in, if you're good in storytelling, if you're good in video editing, become the great, the best and the great at video editing. If you're good at writing, pick up and be, I mean, kind of drill down to, make, to make, be laser focused on what you're good at, so become great at it. Yeah. So by the time you get into someone's desk, you can just say, you know what, my writing is kick ass. My writing can just get to me anywhere because I've spent so many hours to develop it. And the second thing I would focus on is personal brand is huge. Because I'll give you an example right now. If two people walk in the door right now, they're both graduated from Mason. One has a personal blog and he has done awesome writing. He has a couple of followers online. And one doesn't have a blog, doesn't have a personal brand, doesn't have a LinkedIn account. Once I look them up on Google, which one do you think I'm going to hire? Go with the account. <laughs> Get it? Yeah. It's that simple. So start building your, your personal brand every step of the way and document the journey. That's, like the, that's the thing I, I recommend on. You're, if you're already a journalist student, you're probably writing a lot of papers. You're probably doing a lot of research. You're probably going to keep those research and papers submitted to your professor and forget about them. My recommendation, take those papers, 
and transform them into articles, into blogs, into videos, whatever that thing is that you do well. And if you're not that good at it, go to Fiverr, go to Upwork, figure out someone who can help you tell that story differently in a way that no one else has seen it before and start posting that content and build a following. And of course, you're gonna tell me, hey, I have zero followers right now. Guess what? Everybody start with zero followers and you're gonna build it up one after the other because you're able to speak the language of each, each platform. For instance, if you're posting on Instagram, make sure you use hashtags. If you're on Twitter, start mentioning people. If you're on LinkedIn, send messages to those people who you wanna be like one day. So you gotta do the work. You cannot just basically do the, hey, I'm a millennial, what should I do? I mean, if you don't put the hustle, if you don't put the work, no one's gonna hire you. And the fact that people wanna like, the easy way out, there's no easy way out. You gotta send 100 messages to get 10 responses to get one actually person retweeting you. If you don't do that math, you're never gonna get noticed. And, for, and also focus on quality versus quantity. So pick up two, three pieces that you do well and put more effort into amplifying them by sending those messages, by getting in touch with those people who actually could find this valuable. It's gonna help them somewhere in their life. That's the piece of advice that I would give you that's gonna get you noticed once you get out of here because it's, it's about you documenting the journey, how you got here and building me a trust that I could trust you, you're able to deliver what I'm gonna hire you for. I, and you I, have to be lucky. Yeah, luck, I, luck fairs prepared. You know, if, I, and if I may, we have so many questions in no. so little time. Thank so you. what I'm going to do is just do a, a little uh, speed questioning, if that's okay, oh, and we'll take just one answer per. Yeah, please. Okay. Hello, my name is Igor. I'm from Macedonia. Uh, apparently, the country who was called the capital of fake news from CNN. <laughs> in the last, uh, so that is why I'm, I'm. I have to say something in our defense. So uh, in the last year and a half. Uh, all the major media outlets were in Macedonia investigating this fake news thing. And uh, CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, Russia Today, everyone was uh, in this small city in Veles, and they were trying to find out who are these guys who are making the fake news and what is this thing all about. So uh, all, all the world media attention was in Macedonia and as you can see probably there is no more fake news from Macedonia right now. So I was wondering why is that and I've done a re little research why there is no fake news especially not from Macedonia. And I actually talked with the guys who were uh, producing the fake news in, in Macedonia. They're not doing, uh, doing it anymore, and the reason is Facebook and Google. Actually, these two companies banned their commercials on their websites. They were doing this fake news not because of politi political agenda or something, just because of money. And Facebook and Google has the power to ban the commercials out of their websites. So now my question is, uh, is it better for uh, us to live in a society where two companies can block uh, any web page out there, or at least can block their ads, so they have no reason to produce any more fake news, or it is better to have a, a world where the editors can, can uh, control the content. Thank it, you it so much. Sense. Uh, who would like to take Peter? I'll take a shot at it. I mean, I think, I think what you're describing is a decision by Google and Facebook to exercise editorial control. Um, they saw something that was, was inappropriate or wrong and, and took it down. And I, I would rather live in a world, just to bring it back to Chris Matthews' point of editors, that doesn't mean that it's, it's regulated and people don't have access to exercise uh, their First Amendment rights. But I think in the absence, there is the potential for chaos. And I think we've seen where um, these issues could go. And, and I think we're smart to get, to, to get a hold of it. Uh, thank you, Peter. And a question over here to the right. Hi, my name is Alexa. Um, thank you all so much for your time. So my question is in regards to getting the bigger picture. Um, Mr. Spear suggested that influencers may not be the best um, to follow because they may not provide a full picture of whatever they're talking about, the news article, the story. Um, I was just wondering how that would be different from following um, certain biased news outlets. Um, because if we choose the influencers that align with our political ideologies, aren't we apt to do that with our other news sources as well, like Fox News or even Hardball with Chris Matthews, depending on what side you're on? 
Alexa, thank you. Jack? Yeah, you are. Um, so, you know, when you put it, the, you, you ask what's the difference? And again, I think the difference goes to some editing, some oversight of content. Now, you know, I don't know how you vet your influencers. I don't know how anybody vets their influencers. But I would be willing to suggest that most people pick influencers who in some way reflect their viewpoints or their ideology or something that appeals to them individually. Now, they could be trustworthy, they could not be trustworthy. Media outlets can be also have the same problem. You can say people pick their news outlets the same way. And they can be less trustworthy or more trustworthy. I think editors is, is a big, I think Chris really hit on something important. And that is that unfiltered content with no mediation whatsoever that just goes out can be anything the individual person wants it to be. Usually, at least in a bigger media outlet, there's somebody who's saying, okay, this is fine or this is not fine, or we need to check this fact or not check this fact. And I'm gonna throw something out there just to think about in terms of the whole idea of fact checking, by the way, which is not a panacea, because we got in a lot of trouble when Congresswoman Gabby Giffords was shot and we reported on our air that she had died. And the reason we did that is because we have a two-source rule at NPR, which sounds, I know, kind of quaint, but we do. And so we have to have two sources. And unfortunately, in this case, we had two sources. The problem was they were just talking to one another. So we really only had one source. We had a source on the Hill and a source in the police department in Arizona. And they were both talking to one another, so we really had one source. And they were both wrong. So the traditional media, even if you try to source, to the best of your ability, you're going to make mistakes occasionally. Um, and we corrected that mistake after we made it. I don't know how much correction goes on. Do influencers correct themselves when they make a mistake? I don't know. Do they have to? Or do they just go on? And you can argue that there's plenty of traditional media that makes mistakes and just goes on also. I'm not going to name names, <laughs> but um, there's a lot of that too. So I don't know if I'm answering your question. I'm just kind of trying to give you something to think about when you look at that difference between influencers and traditional media and say, well, they're the same side of, uh, of a different coin. I'm not sure they are. The, the quick one, there's no right or wrong. There's the best guess. I mean, that's kind of, I'm going to end it there so we can get another question. Roy, thank you. Um, one question left from each side. So one question here, please. And I'm, I'm sorry, we're not going to get to the other questions with, with one last question over to the right. Hi, my name is uh, Sonia Bahu, and I'm a freshman at Mason. Um, I think that, I'm oh, oh, sorry, this is good. It's good? Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Sonia Bahu, and I'm a freshman at Mason. Um, I think we can all agree that cable news has evolved and that it's transitioned into social media platforms like Facebook Live and Instagram Live, and it's used by a lot of people. So my question is, do you think that traditional cable news will eventually diminish? Kevin, do you want to, do you want to, you want to take a shot at that? God, I hope so. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> joke. Um, look, the, 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 the traditional media outlets are always evolving and reinventing themselves. Um, I would suggest that the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR are engaged in reinventing themselves. Are they? Not as rapidly as you might like, but they are evolving. Um, it's going to be tag team, I see. And, and uh, <laughs> they, are, they are experimenting with, with different ways of telling stories and having different people tell the stories and producing for public consumption more of the raw material. Um, You've all heard of cord cutting, right? I mean, uh, you're going to access everything you want and all the information you, your heart desires on your smartphone or, or tablet, um, wherever you are, without connection or subscription or obligation um, to the purveyor. I think it, it, it's the technology, technology is just moving there very, very rapidly. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And the last question for the morning. 
Hi, my name is Allison. I'm a junior in communications with public relations as my concentration. And my question is about how you determine the validity of facts when taking them from the media or um, even television. You know, that is such a great question that how about we go around uh, the panel and let you make that part of your closing remarks, if we could do that. Uh, and Roy, we'll start with you. So how do, how, how do I determine the facts? How do you determine what is fact and what is opinion and what is um, not part of the media's agenda, essentially, possibly? Let's put it this way. Everyone has an agenda. Whether you like it or not, they have an agenda. Whoever, whoever you're following, they have an agenda to basically tell you the story that, from their own version. Mm -hmm. So the way I always go back to, again, it's up to you. It's up to you to become a self-aware person, to equip yourself with different sources, different ideas, different places to get information from, to, get, to make the best and the right judgment. And also gonna, it's going to go back to think about those who are publishing, what's in their best interest, and where they're trying to take you. And, and if you do that for every single source you do it, you might have a better idea and better version of the story you're trying to construct in your mind. I would agree with that. I think you need to check multiple yes. sources. Um, <laughs> nailed it. I, I, I think done. you need think to check done. multiple sources. I don't think I you can rely on, on the New York Times or NPR or your favorite blogger or any number of other things that are gonna be out there and just say, okay, this is the um, definitive word on this story. There's no other points of view. There's nothing else. I just believe this and this is how we go on. Um, you do have to be a news consumer and news consumers and consumers of all kinds tend to shop, right? So you need to shop around and look at what all the various outlets are doing. And, and we do this. I mean, we're not just sitting there saying, well, we're putting out this version and that's the only version there is. And, you know, you should just believe it because we put it out there. I don't think we're trying to do that. Um, I think what we're trying to do is present sometimes a more in-depth view of a story, sometimes a view of a story someone else isn't necessarily covering as much as we think it should be covered. And um, I think in the end, consumers of news are gonna be the ones that have to be the, the arbiters and the deciders, but they're gonna have, you, it's up to you to just look at, you know, more than one source, unless you just wanna pick something that reflects your viewpoints and ignore everything else, which plenty of news consumers also do. Peter? I, I, would, I would just, I would echo Jack, multiple sources. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's critical. And then, and then common sense. I mean, if you're, if you're working on a project and you're handed a fact, what more often than not, you're not handed a fact. You're handed a statistic. And as, and as Roy knows, you can, you can count lots of things and draw from that conclusions. Conclusions are not always facts. The data may be absolute, but what that data then means is really interpretation, not fact. The problem is, is that fact has become the way of the politician saying, it's fact careful there and I think you have to you just have to use some common sense and and go deeper into the data uh, and in a world of data I think it's it's rich and really interesting but it's ultimately very complex Kevin buyer beware <laughs> yeah. always nice to end with the Latin <laughs> thank you for your time so I, let me thank the panel great job thank you so much I'd also like to uh, thank uh, GMU, the uh, School of Communications, and I also want to thank you for such terrific uh, questions, interactivity, and attention. Thank you all so much.